All right. So I think we should. Uh, I should start now. So by now, PNMDP is a household name because everyone is quite familiar of what we are doing. We are promoting quality education in child health. We are the pediatric and neonatal multidisciplinary developmental program of Pakistan. What is our aim? Our main aim is to improve skills and knowledge of our trainees and also to refresh knowledge of pediatricians and neonatologists through our workshops and sessions that are highly informative, involving multidisciplinary teams. And the aim is to improve mortality and morbidity. We have distinguished uh, members in our PNMTP team. You all know our founder, Dr. Ayaz Ahmad. And then we have a list of board members and members. Now the upcoming sessions in June, June is a star studded with new topics from the unit of hematology and pediatric emergency. We would be conducting BCQs with explanation on these two topics, as well as on nephrology and hematology. We would also be conducting the PNMDP case competition. Now this would include interesting cases from Pakistan, UK and Ireland, and we would be having um, judges who would select the best cases. The first prize winner would have 10,000 rupees as a prize, and the second prize winner would be awarded a, a prize of 5,000 rupees. So that's something to look forward to. We have basic neonatology skills workshop coming as well. That is um, a first time in Pakistan, a workshop that is RCPCH recognized and approved for CPD points. So very big things coming in the month of June. Apart from that, you can always have uh, videos on common clinical and theory topics. You can watch them on our YouTube channel, which is named PNMDP. And you can also contribute and write to us. Our website has been developing and you could contribute to it through your short and long case cases. If you have some interesting cases, image or videos, if you have anything to contribute to our blog section, you could contribute and you could write to us on our PNMTP Gmail address. So the good news I've already shared, first time in Pakistan coming on 26th and 27th, June, 2021, a CPD approved, RCPCH approved CPD providing workshop. Also, don't be a silent member. You can be a part of our team as well. Be a PNMDP regional trainee representative. That is, you can contribute to us. You can be our volunteer. And to do that, I'll be sharing this link in the chat box. And you can click on it, fill the form, and email us so that you could volunteer with us for some period of time. Case presentation competition I've already discussed. Uh, we have ended our uh, cases collection and now it's going to be held very soon. Today, today's topic uh, is chronic liver disease and the survey on today's topic, this link would be posted by me towards the end of uh, the session please do fill this survey because it would help us to improve our session. It's very critical. And uh, I would request everyone to click on this survey and fill it up for us at the end of the session. So Dr. Arif, now you can share your slide. Um, I just need to end my slideshow. Yes. Yes, Dr. Arif, you're good to go. Yeah, allow me. Uh, because... Yes, yes. I have allowed you and just let me uh, introduce you. We have our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Aris Prakash, who is a pediatrician with special interest in get pediatric gastroenterology. And today he has been very kind enough to give us uh, time to conduct this session. Thank you, sir. 
So you can just click on your um, share screen because I've stopped my screen sharing. I'm getting that host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, let me just... Uh... I'm extremely sorry. <laughs> I'm extremely sorry. I just forgot to, you know, click on that. Uh, so can you once again try? No, it's okay. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Salaam alaikum and hello to everyone. Uh, my voice is clear. Please kindly tell me that. Voice is clear? Yes, or... sir. It is clear to me. It is clear to me. Yes. Okay. So, uh, my name is Dr. Arith Prakash and uh, I am Assistant Professor, Pediatric Gastroenterologist at National Institute of Child Health, Karachi. So today this opportunity has been given to me to share my knowledge about the chronic liver disease. Although uh, we all know that long cases are better to be with a patient on the bedside, but in this uh, era of COVID, if you are doing this Zoom meeting, it's also better and will refresh our knowledge. And uh, definitely the pattern will be not the same as when we do over the patient and looking at the sign and symptoms of the patient, we make our differential diagnosis. Here we will discuss broadly about all these things and uh, I will try to cover that uh, uh, things, all those things which I have realized that uh, most of the time uh, our postgraduates have a concern regarding those points that how to explain them and what are those and I have tried also to show you a clinical signs as someone has not seen those signs that can be well appreciated about that. And you can ask any question and last we will further explain that question. So uh, we are starting uh, our today's session of lung case on chronic liver disease. Through my presentation that uh, I will briefly describe the definition of chronic liver disease then we will discuss that what should be asked in a history when we are uh, dealing with a patient of the chronic liver disease, what are the important examination findings, and definitely on the history and examination, we have further moved to make a diagnosis or list of differential diagnoses, and again, on basis of that list, investigations are important. Then, because there are so many diseases some are particularly uh, in the infant age group and some are in the older children. So I have kept management specifically with uh, these diseases that uh, we will discuss one by one those diseases. And finally, prognosis and a little about liver transplantation because nowadays that it is being done in our country. There are three or four centers which are doing and many children's post liver transplant in our country are there. So we have an idea about that. So- Dr. Yeah. Aris? Yes. Sorry uh, to interrupt. If you could adjust your microphone or maybe increase your voice settings. A couple of people were saying that the voice is not that much clear. If you could just increase the voice volume, the speaker volume and just adjust your okay. microphone. Okay, I have you kept it. Now uh, you can ask from them, is it clear? Yes, we'll get the feedback, sir. Uh, um, uh, you can continue, we'll get the feedback. Okay. So uh, for the definition, as we know that uh, clinical or biochemical derangement of liver function that persists more than three months or a presence of clinical stigmata, which we will discuss at any time that we label as a chronic liver disease. And we know that that hepatocyte injury may be caused by viruses, drugs, hypoxia, certain genetic diseases. These all injuries 
lead to the inflammation and then necrosis and tissue death. Then there is a healing process, scar formation, fibrosis, and we know that liver have a regenerating capacity. But after the damage, that regeneration is not smooth one. There is a nodular regeneration in certain areas having surrounded by fibrosis and ultimately that progressively all liver diseases lead to the cirrhosis. And these are the lists that either genetic or metabolic diseases, idiopathic or structural like pleuritrasia, polydopal cyst, autoimmune diseases, then certain regions are drug induced. So ultimately when these all diseases causes significant damage and significant degree of fibrosis that will lead to the cirrhosis. And then in a chronic liver disease, in all patients that end consequences, we deal with the portal hypertension, ascites, and hepatic encephalopathy. And importantly, in the pediatric population, we must have to look about the growth and development and nutrition because it is a profound effect in our uh, pediatric population because there's a growing age period where we gain height and weight. So that is also get compromised in the process of chronic liver disease. And there can be secondary involvement of liver where that may be because of the metastatic liver diseases, storage disorders, or uh, nowadays that uh, obesity is the leading one that causes the fat infiltration in the liver, causing the NAFLD or NASH, we will discuss, and systemic conditions, infectious diseases like tuberculosis, miliary tuberculosis, typhoid. Then we have to also keep in mind about the congestive heart failure that uh, uh, cardiomyopathies can cause the big flow of blood and there's the severe congestion of the liver leading to the uh, passive congestion and cardiac cirrhosis. So we have to also keep in mind about the cardiac cause. So now coming towards the symptoms that we are discussing about the history. So, uh, when patients come that definitely age is very important and we will discuss the age wise uh, categorization of diseases after and during the and differential diagnosis so patient may come with the abdominal distension and that abdominal distension can be because of uh, ascites or it can be because of hepatosplomegaly and uh, that uh, abnormal uh, enlargement of viscera so these both can present with as abdominal distension Jaundice is also presenting feature, not in the all cases of chronic liver diseases, basically in the infant age group, those are very polystatic. They present with the jaundice, deep jaundice, while then the, as child get older and uh, in a five to six year, you might not get the jaundice in those children and sometime in the autoimmune hepatitis and Wilson's disease, there is an ongoing damage. They can present with the jaundice. Pruritus again is the feature of the polystatic liver disease. Most commonly that we see the progress of familial intrahepatic cholestasis that present with the pruritus because of the bile salt irritating the unmarinated C fibers causing feel of the itch and child scratches. And then urine color is important in a jaundice baby because that can help you that if urine is clear despite child is jaundice, that will tell you that you are dealing with unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia because it's not excreting in the urine. But if urine is dark one, that will give clue that it's a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Stool color is very important in infant age group. Again, that you know that pillary atresia patient present with a clay color stool and that is uh, uh, one sort of uh, surgical uh, urgency that you have to diagnose early within two months and you have to go for the proper uh, procedure of the surgery otherwise uh, liver will get rosed and then uh, big, uh, that surgery will not help and further uh, we have to move towards the liver transplantation so stool color is also very important even in the older children when there is autoimmune hepatitis or viral hepatitis because of the hepatocyte swelling, uh, swollen hepatitis causes the 
obstruction of canaliculi and can they have a clay color too. Now talking about the hematemesis and the melina, these are the consequences of the portal hypertension and lead to the varices, portal gastritis that lead to the bleeding that there, there can be a profound hematemesis or when that blood come via the stool that become tarry color and the melina. So sometime there is no jaundice, child is only failure to thrive and having the abdominal distension and they present with the hematemesis and the melina. Swelling that edema, uh, it is also most frequent complaint of patients with the chronic liver disease that are present and fatigue is a systemic uh, uh, symptom and then as we discussed that in the pediatric age group that growth and development is very important that many children present with the short stature having the occult chronic liver disease and when we work up for the short stature then we find that those are suffering from chronic liver disease and we then we work up for the etiology. Another important uh, uh, area that you have to ask in the history apart from this presentation and the sign and symptoms of the complications like hematemesis and melina that there is tendency to fat male absorption so we know the fat soluble vitamins that we have to ask question about the vitamin a deficiency that we have to ask about from the child regarding the night blindness we have to ask about the rough skin skin texture that have been changed that will lead, tell you about the vitamin A deficiency. Mm -hmm. Then about the bruises and rashes on the body that will tell you about the vitamin K deficiency. Again, vitamin E deficiency okay, presents with the ataxia and then the rickets that because of vitamin D deficiency mm -hmm. that pre child can present with the rickets and then fat male absorption causing large bulky stool having the foul smelling. And then apart from that, these are the particular symptoms related to the chronic liver disease and its complications and the fat male absorption that you can ask about the systemic symptoms or systemic inquiry. When we see the etiology like talking about the autoimmune hepatitis, there can be history of fever, joint pain, rashes, uh, recurrent fever history, arthritis and in case of Wilson's disease that symptoms of the neuro neurological that dystonia and uh, silly semi left normal behavior a recent change in the study pattern that that all these systemic symptoms you have to ask so particularly and in the differential diagnosis I will further highlight that in which underlying disease which symptoms are more important so it was the general about the symptoms. So not only the duration of the symptoms that we have to ask about this symptom that from uh, the duration of those complaints and as we know that we put it down in the chronological order that first complaint that started that will be the first and followed by the symptoms which sequence appears. So length of symptoms that time is very important to mention in the history. Uh, and please mute them. Okay, thank you. So, uh, types of investigation means sometime a new patient of chronic liver disease you can get, and sometime already diagnosed or already worked up cases you can get, and in those situation in the history that again uh, the responsibility increases that we must. Uh, ask in the history that what sort of investigation has been carried out they can tell you about that if eye examination has been done or any mri brain has been done or uh, ultrasound has been done so these trumps parents can tell you in the history that such sort of investigation has been done although during the history we have not to see the investigation but at least we have to ask whatever done sometime uh, some patient has undergone underwent for the liver biopsy so we have to ask about the investigations in that and then definitely if already diagnosed and work up case you are getting then management that we have to ask about the what sort of the management he or she might have taken and at its uh, uh, at that moment that 
either any sort of complications because of disease or because of the treatment if child having we have to highlight these all in on the history uh, let's suppose a, a patient of the wilson disease is taking vistamin and uh, penicillin for uh, six months seven months and he's complaining of the failure or he's complaining of the hematuria in the same way so these when we know about the complication and we will keep in the mind we have to detail ask all these uh, and document these that already what management what investigations have been done and what sort of complication now we are thinking at this moment along with this admission so same is the true with the past history that sometime you uh, take the history from the presenting symptoms and then everything you will ask in the past history about the diagnosis if already done with all these things which we discussed earlier and any sort of the complications. So in chronic liver disease, family history is also very important. Majority of the liver disease are the metabolic liver diseases and these are the genetic causes are there. So history of the consanguinity and history of the affected family member is very important. And not only the uh, history of uh, liver disease in the family, sometime in the Wilson's disease, in the siblings, you have a history of neurological diseases that there is a occult liver disease and they have a dystonia and abnormal behavior in elder siblings, and you will get the neuro history of neuro Wilson. So that will also point out towards the diagnosis. So family history is very important in such situations. Immunization history that we know about the hepatitis B has been incorporated in our EPI program since so long, despite that our vaccination coverages are not good and have a lot of cases of hepatitis B in our country as well. So it is very important that you ask about that uh, immunization history in that particular uh, reason. So socioeconomically, that uh, definitely a uh, patient is a child and uh, he has an impact of the disease. Family also has an impact from financial point of view, from traveling point of view, even in the COVID situation that everything is difficult to going anywhere or earning finance, all these issues that we have to ask about in a detail in a family history and impact on the family and if any sort of social support, because many of the our Wilson's disease patients are getting their uh, treatment from Bethel Mall or uh, so such social support, you have to dig out in the history that are they are getting or not might could help those after knowing about their status that either they afford it or not. And we know about the certain organization that might help them. So moving towards the examination that uh, again, weight, height and their percentiles are very important. And most of the time, chronic liver disease patients are short stature, thin, lean, sometimes because of uh, ascites and overfilled, they may might have a higher weight, but uh, most of the time that they are failure to thrive and having the short heights. There is also pubertal delay in the teenage. You have to look for the tenor staging and nutritional status is very important. Edema. Anemia is associated with many uh, liver diseases like autoimmune hepatitis. You may have autoimmune hemolytic anemia concomitantly and in the Wilson's disease that whom's negative hemolysis can may occur. So anemia is also very important and thrombocytopenia, you know that as the feature in chronic liver disease. You have looked for the jaundice, you have looked for the clubbing that uh, that is also feature of chronic liver disease and then fat soluble vitamin deficiencies like rough dry skin, any sort of bruises on the skin and by dots, spots, signs of the rickets. So all those symptoms which we discussed in the science you have to look for. So it's very good uh, slide of examination from when Harris that summarizes about the jaundice and definitely in the examination setting, you will not get unveiled patient. You will get well compensated patient. So uh, you, rarely there's the encephalopathy in the exam setting you will get but you will find that these spider nevi, bruising, bleeding, scratch marks in the cases of progressive familial intrahepatic polystasis, xanthomas, 
when there is the higher cholesterol and evidence of breakage that leads to the uh, caused by vitamin D malabsorption. In hands that liconychia, clubbing, palmar rhythma, sento, meta, I will show you certain pictures of this, these signs. And sometimes we feel that patient is in a compensated stage. And but when we look for the flipping tremors, there is the estrexis is there, and then again wrist widening. So eye changes are very important. That conjunctival cirrhosis and uh, uh, bytorch sparse are very important. Again, chest deformity because of the vitamin D deficiency. And coming towards the abdomen, that we have to look for the umbilicus. We have to look for the shape of the umbilicus. Either it has become slit shape and then uh, visible veins around the umbilicus. Here you can appreciate uh, if you are, uh, you can see my arrow. Uh, so, there is uh, a scar mark most probably at the hypochondrium area that in cases of the polydocal cyst surgeries or in cases of the biliary atresia surgery, we might get such a scar and the cirrhosis liver and there is a splenomegaly in the abdomen. So these are the main signs which we might get in cases of chronic liver disease. Little detail about uh, these signs, which usually we study and rarely we see that spider angiomas in some patients, we appreciate the presence of these spider angiomas, which are basically central pulsating arteriole from which small wiry venules radiate. And it usually occur in the distribution of the superior vena cava. And their size is very between 1 to 10 mm and uh, that is thought to be it is because of the altered metabolism of the estrogen. Then Palmer rhythm and uh, that on the hands hypothenar and uh, thinar eminence you can appreciate and on also on the tips it is also because of uh, altered metabolism of the estrogen. <clears throat> Xenthomas appear when uh, there is a cholesterol level is higher than 500 milligram per dl mostly in the polystatic diseases where uh, there is the probability of high cholesterol and that when it get deposited in the subcutaneous tissue mainly in the extensor surfaces of the elbow and the knee really around the eyelid that will be appreciable and you all have seen clubbing and then edema we see at the ankle and knee and we categorize either grade one grade two grade three here the first one patient having the these are the bruises and you can feel the small hematomas on the uh, chest that is also because of vitamin k deficiency and only with the injection of vitamin k it got better so uh, sometimes that till they are not recognized they are not diagnosed and they are not given fed soluble vitamins they might get these uh, these complications that they bleed in the skin and God forbid, if they get bleed in the CNS, that intracranial bleed, you know that then child become probability that they may become abnormal and uh, having the seizures and fits disorders. So these all are preventable. So suspect early, look carefully and treat properly. Then there's the jaundice. Third one picture is showing you the uh, uh, skin thickening that in cases of progress to familial intrahepatic cholestasis you will see the patient they will constantly itch and because of constant itching there's a thickening of their skin like unification of skin and you can find their hands like a changes like a very hard and leather type of skin so that is the picture of one of my patient of the progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis Below is the three patients that showing that when there is the abdominal distension of ascites in a neonatal period, then you will get this shiny skin because in the newborn that that skin get stretched and it gives shiny look. While when child get older, then that shiny look is not there, but you will also get the ascites in older children. And the last one picture in the lower row, if you appreciate, there are three scar marks. This unfortunate patient has got uh, some burn marks to cure his chronic liver disease. So these practices are also going on in our peripheries and uh, we must recognize these that our uh, children, our patients are suffering or 
from such situations as well that is very 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 unfortunate so most of the time many have a concern about the visible beings and when see the visible beings then they uh, worry about the flow how to check what will be the underlying cause of the flow so that i thought it is important that i should put this visible beans so one is the capit medusa when there is a visible beans around the umbilicus you can see in the picture of the center uh, newborn having the post cassai procedure scar mark is there that visible beans or only at the umbilicus and below is the given the typical picture of that capit medusa another type of the visible veins are the peripheral veins in above patient you can appreciate that those veins are not around the umbilicus but these are in the peripheral areas so definitely that these umbilical veins indicate uh, cirrhotic or portal hypertension and these are the portosystemic shunt area which become prominent while the peripheral veins are these are superficial vessels that remain normally closed but when there is an inferior vena cava obstruction or in case of cirrhosis then they give the upward flow but sometimes in a superior vena cava uh, in inferior vena cava obstruction portal vein obstruction liver cirrhosis there is the flow upward because inferior vena cava is closed then blood has to move towards the superior vena cava means towards upwards and they they vessels empty their blood in the superior vena cava and throw that that goes towards the heart but when there is a superior vena cava obstruction then there will be the flow downward from these superficial veins so uh, i have also illustrated here picture how to check the flow that you have to empty the vessel a prominent vessel with both finger then once you have uh, put uh, one finger off and you see the rapid filling from which side it is going to be rapid filling and that rapid filling phase will tell you that either flow is going upward or downward so don't confuse about these visible veins uh, caput medusa is particularly around the umbilicus whatever the other veins we are looking these are the peripheral veins and normally these are collapsed and they have no flow but in cases of chronic liver disease they become prominent and flow from goes upward because below is the obstruction either because of ibc or because of the hepatic veins due to cirrhosis or portal hypertension these all cause the reversal of flow and flow now from goes from downward to upwards so after that inspection that uh, the detailed liver examination is very important we have to see the liver uh, feel liver if it is palpable we have to look for its consistency that either it is soft which is normally liver is soft if it has become firm or hard indicating the chronic liver disease and its margin usually margins are rounded in cases of chronic liver disease they become sharp you will feel a sharp margin and then you have to measure the liver in the mid clavicular line uh, below right costal margin for the right lobe and for the left lobe you have to measure in the midline below the zephy sternal point you have also see the either liver is tender or not then you have to measure about the liver span and for the liver span you have to take the uh, landmark angular fluis from manubrium sterni and from second intercostal space from right side you have to percuss in the third fourth fifth intercostal space till that you get liver dullness and from there till the palpable of liver in the mid clavicular line uh, below the right costal margin you have to take a total liver span regarding size of the liver normal measurements i have put here that difference is from nelson that uh, at newborn that total liver span is 4.5 to 5 cm and uh, till 12 year that in boys it becomes 7 to 8 cm and the girls it is a bit smaller that 6 to 6.5 cm so that is the normal span of the liver till 12 year of the age and sometime that the right lobe is palpable which is a downward projection from the right side uh, because we should know about that because clinically there is no significance of this extra lobe of liver then coming towards the uh, ascites that most of the time trainees are confused that 
we should do the fluid thrill or I have to check for the shifting dullness. So uh, we know that in a shifting dullness, we shift the dullness. Normally, if we percuss over the abdomen, the note is resonant one all over the because uh, there is the air filled vowels are there. So we have a note of the air there, not the dull. Whenever there's water comes, that area become dull on tapping. So uh, when a patient is lying supine, then its maximum epigastric area is a region where uh, fluid is not there and fluid goes in the flanks. It gravitates in the flanks. If full whole abdomen is filled with uh, fluid, then what happened? Wherever you percuss, there will be the dull note. So you will not get. So on look, obvious distinction is there. You have to go for fluid thrill. And definitely when thrill thrill is positive, means there is a everywhere fluid in the abdominal cavity. There will be no resonant or tympanic note to find out the air anywhere. But when there is a mild to moderate quantity of the fluid in the abdominal cavity that gravitate in the flanks in the supine position of the patient, then you have a, uh, when you uh, tap over the abdomen starting from epigastric region, you will get there is the resonant note and it go down in the flanks area, it become dull. And where you are getting dull, you have to change the position of the patient. And that as fluid will gravitate opposite side, that area will become free from fluid and there will be no dullness so that is the shifting dullness so if there is a space in the abdominal cavity then shifting dullness will be positive if there is no space then there will be the fluid thrill positive so that is the this and apart from that percussion then you have not forgot the auscultation and uh, you have to look for the inguinal hernias genitalias and then systemic examination along with the liver disease examination so coming toward the differential diagnosis so from history and examination, we get the point and we uh, sometime on the look of the patient and certain features, we make the diagnosis in the mind, like uh, we are dealing with a two month old infant who has came with the jaundice. So in our mind, there will be the neonatal hepatitis, blurry atresia, uh, calicosemia as sometimes severe condition and PFIC, obstructed polydocal cyst, elegyl syndrome have a particular features, cystic fibrosis, anti alpha 1 anti trypsin deficiency, and familial tyrosemia type 1. So, when these findings, these diagnoses come in our mind, so we have to ask particular questions. Like if you are thinking about the neonatal hepatitis, then birth history become very important. We have to ask from the mother any history of the fever or the rage. Uh, during first trimester or during third trimester and uh, we will also see the head circumference of child that will be very important or thrombocytopenia uh, for the particular rashes we will look for. In the same way in the case of biliary atresia that is two color will be very important otherwise child will be very healthy looking and growing well in the initial months only there is slight jaundice but the stool will be the uh, white in color or ice cream color, we can say clay color stool that will be the indicator for that. Galactosemia is a very dangerous, means lethal condition that as when child is put on the galactose containing milk that they become sick, they develop sepsis, they have a cataract along with other features, they have a severe abdominal distension, means they present with the uh, liver failure of infancy. Progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis, as I already mentioned during examination, that these patients present with a severe itching. They have a severe itching and uh, even the skin become hard because of itching. What and they have, a, they have a jaundice and they have a fat male absorption. They present with the rickets, vitamin A deficiency changes, bruises, intracranial bleeds, and they have a oil in the stool, fat male absorption. Uh, that indicates so they present like that. Obstructed polydocal cyst. Polydocal cyst can present at any age. Whenever it get infected, they can present with cholangitis. But variety that obstructed polydocal cyst come earlier, and it comes in the differential diagnosis of the blurry atresia, and it presents same like the blurry atresia. Only ultrasound will help in cases of blurry atresia. There will be the no bile duct visible, while in the polydocal cyst, there will be the dilated bile extrahepatic duct 
and because of obstruction that there will be the clay color stool. Elegyle syndrome, they have a syndromic feces, they also have a itching and they have also cardiac problem, uh, peripheral pulmonary stenosis, they have a vertebral problem, they have a eye finding specific to the elegyle syndrome that posterior embryo toxin. Then cystic fibrosis, uh, in cases of cystic fibrosis, your systemic inquiry will help you that you will get the recurrent chest infection along with the liver uh, sign and symptoms. So that recurrent chest infection, failure to thrive will help you for the making the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, although rare, they present with the jaundice or they may be present with the hepatomegaly only and uh, that should be kept in a differential diagnosis. Familiar tyrosinemia type 1, because uh, uh, we are uh, in our country, there is a high rate of consanguineous marriages, and we are looking at the cases of the familial tyrosinemia type 1. They usually present either in infancy or some toddler age group with the liver cirrhosis. So we have to keep in mind about this diagnosis as well. Now, talking about the older children above the four year and five year of the age when a child of chronic liver disease comes to you, mainly we make the differential diagnosis depending upon the history. If you are getting the history of the fever, joint pain, rashes, then autoimmune hepatitis will be the first hour differential. If we are getting family history and any neurological symptoms, then we will discuss about the Wilson's disease first and uh, definitely that in our country that prevalence of hepatitis b or c is very higher and even in the thalassemic patients we are getting a lot of hepatitis c positivity and because of low rate of immunization that hepatitis b is also there so we have to uh, means we have to screen for b and c of the chronic liver disease patient because they might be a concomitantly present along with other Wilson's disease or autoimmune hepatitis, that is the also possibility. Other metabolic group that glycogen storage disease, they don't have a jaundice for abdominal distension, but they might present with the hypoglycemic fits and uh, uh, they, so they have abdominal distension and uh, they have a particular stall like facies, some particular examination points that, that uh, tell us about this, uh, this disease. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or uh, steatohepatitis, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. These both are related with the obesity and uh, now the digestive week is going on and that their theme is also the obesity. After the uh, curative treatment of hepatitis C in the world, now the this uh, uh, Fatty liver is a leading cause for liver cirrhosis and liver failure. So it's very important that we have to be conscious earlier. And the obese children, even in the thin lean children, you may get the fatty liver disease. So we have, you have to also think about this uh, uh, entity as well in your differentials. So coming towards the investigation, that routine investigation, that CBC is very important. Because, uh, uh, because of chronic uh, liver disease or chronic disease, you may get the anemia, macrocytic anemia. And, uh, but in cases of uh, viral hepatitis, uh, in cases of autoimmune hepatitis, you may get Combs positive hemolytic anemia. In cases of Wilson's disease, you may get, may get hemolytic anemia with spherocytes that Combs will be negative. Uh, you may get low platelet, low WBC that indicating hyperspelinism, which is the complication of the portal hypertension. So liver function test, you can divide into four categories that uh, synthetic liver function. We look for the albumin and prothrombin time that particularly if albumin is low and uh, PT is prolonged and it is not corrected by vitamin K. We, they, so we say that significant advanced liver disease, that end-stage liver disease, that our prothrombin time is not getting better. So they indicate the liver synthetic function. Then uh, uh, biliary excretion, that total and direct bilirubin. In some cases, we have an elevated bilirubin and some cases that we might not have elevated bilirubin. High gamma GT and high alkaline phosphatase, both these 
indicate towards the uh, polystatic liver diseases, but in cases of the PFIC type 1 and type 2, you may have a low gamma GT. And in cases of uh, uh, type 3 PFIC, you have a high gamma GT. And uh, in biliary atresia, in the polydopal cyst, you will get the high gamma GT, indicating that biliary problem, bile duct injuries. Alkaline phosphatase in the pediatric age group because uh, they are growing one and it's also one source from the bone. So it might be higher because of rickets, concomitant fat male absorption, and it may be high because of biliary injury. So that become non-specific, that gamma GT will become very, very specific in such situations. And ALT and SG will indicate the hepatocellular damage. Ultrasound can help you whatever you looked in the examination, any hepatomegaly, ultrasound will confirm the size, it will tell you about the uh, if regular or nodular or cirrhotic liver, splenomegaly, presence of ascites, portal vein size or portal hypertension, usually portal pressure in the pediatric age group is 3 to 6 mmHg. If anything higher than 10 mmHg indicates the portal hypertension or by the Doppler, you can look at the reversal of flow that will help you that for significant chronic liver disease. And endoscopy that you can see about the esophageal varices or gastric varices and then other investigations are disease specific that what possible three different shells you are making on the basis of the history and the examination, then their further specific investigation will be accordingly so uh, those I have kept separately along with the disease. So certain diseases I will share with you along with the management. So specific therapies are available. Our main aim in cases of the chronic liver disease to early diagnosis, make early diagnosis of the possible curable diseases to halt the fibrosis. Once it become advanced liver disease, it has become cirrhotic liver, then those specific treatment will not work. So whenever you talk about the management, you will talk about that the first of all, I will uh, uh, classify the child that at what stage this uh, patient is. And if there is any specific underlying disease, we will focus on the management of that specific disease to prevent the further damage of the liver. And if we are unable to do this, then ultimately that all patient will go in the cirrhosis, then we have to treat portal hypertension, we have to treat ascites, we have to treat the fat male absorption. And uh, in cases of end stage liver disease, the, we have to treat the liver transplantation. So main aim and focus, the, but early start the particular therapy. So, well, what are the therapies and uh, what are the diseases we are discussing one by one. Some liver disease are only curable with the only dietary management. Galactosemia, if you diagnose properly and you remove the galactose, you will see a dramatic change. Your glycogen storage disease, it requires only diet modification, cornstarch, not proper any sort of further medications of higher dose or toxic or immunosuppressive, nothing. So these both diseases are can be cured with the dietary management. Either not cured can be controlled that their symptoms can be minimized. So talking about the galactosemia, we know that it is an autosomal recessive disorder and uh, because of the GAL1 put enzyme deficiency present the fulminant hepatic failure in the infancy and we have a constantly deranged uh, PTA, PGT and low albumin means signs of the liver failure. And you might get the cataract and that abdominal distension, this such shiny abdomen. And when you go for the urine reducing substance, other than glucose, you will get that positive. And on the sugar chromatography, you can get galactose. And then for the enzyme assay and genetic testing, you might go for the diagnosis. Once you diagnose, you have to put on the soya-based formula. You have to remove the lactose and galactose from the diet. And they, the children remain very well on that. Uh, galactose free diet and mostly they become normal having no hepatomegaly but whatever some damage already have done that cataracts if they have developed they remain there so we have to continue for the ophthalmic examination in the same way in the cases of glycogen storage disease at the 
I told you that they present the chippy cheek, hepatomegaly, they have increased appetite because they have a constant low sugar hypoglycemia, they have a short stature, and then you will get low sugar, high enzyme, and along with this, if you are thinking about the glycogen storage disease, you have to put other investigation in like lactic acid, uric acid, and triglyceride, CPK levels sometime that they also have a muscle involvement, and diagnosis on the liver biopsy, and further genetic testing you can go for. So liver biopsy will show the hyperglycogenated nuclei and uh, that make the diagnosis of uh, excessive glycogen is deposited now glycogen diagnosis, the storage disease you can diagnose. And treatment is the dietary therapy that you use the alternative pathway, you restrict the galactose, fructose, sucrose, and you give uncooked corn starch, you can give glucose D and uh, that corn starch that on these therapy that GSD type 1 you have to control the uh, metabolic crisis and then children remain well if you you can't cure completely but at least control the disease and uh, they may remain short but most of the time they remain well with this treatment and GSD type 4 is the exception that it causes the liver cirrhosis early in the life and by the two years or three years it get needs liver transplantation. Certain liver disease you can uh, uh, you, you can treat along with the dietary management and drug therapy and Wilson's disease the most common we are looking at that really present after five years of the age can present as acute or chronic hepatitis can present as a fulminant failure hemolysis they have a low alkaline phosphatase sometimes they present neurological features liver disease occult in them that we not find any sign of the jaundice or any sort of the complaint of the liver disease but they present with the neurological symptoms that slurred speech you might have seen this KF ring sometime visible with eyes and uh, most of the time you have to confirm with the slit lamp uh, eye examination and uh, in the MRI you will in a neuro Wilson will get bilateral basal ganglia involvement symmetrical basal ganglia involvement so <clears throat> you have a high urinary copper and you have a low ceruloplasmin less than uh, 0.2 gram per liter or less than 20 milligram per deciliter and Copper is higher more than 200 that make the diagnosis of Wilson disease. Once you diagnose, if you will not treat, it's a uniformly fatal child may die by 8 to 9 or 10 years of the age. If you treat, sometime on the screening, we may get asymptomatic passage in the family. Those can be treated with the low copper diet, oral zinc. You have to avoid diet. Uh, chocolate, nerds, legumes, mushrooms, shellfish, brain, and liver because they are high copper containing uh, items. So you have to remove from diet and you have to administer uh, copper chelating agents, deep penicillamine, and sometimes that deep penicillamine causes irreversible marrow suppression. You have to follow up, monitor for the CBC, and there is a glomerulonephritis you have to look ask for the hematuria on the follow-up and you have to look for the urine dr for the, any sort of granular cost when these two complications are there these are the irreversible complications then you have to stop with the deep slum and then you have to go for the trientine and other options so uh, in case of wilson's disease uh, when you are making the diagnosis of wilson disease then you have to uh, tell about the diet and about the drug and their follow-up and their management then hereditary tyrosinemia type 1 that it usually present the infant age group with uh, <clears throat> abdominal distension they may present the polyuria rickets they may have a neurological crisis and sometimes leading to death and sometimes converting that uh, severe cirrhotic liver to the hepatocellular carcinoma and present presence with ascites you can appreciate in this my patient of the tyrosinemia that uh, visible ricket rosary and abdominal distension visible veins and its alpha phytoproteins are strikingly high about 91,471 means very high level of alpha phytoprotein diagnosis on the basis of urinary succinyl acetone normally you will not get that in the urine but in cases of tyrosinemia there is an elevated urinary succinyl acetone and again management is with dietary and this specialized formula and with the nitocidone or you have to go for when there is a advanced end stage liver disease then these drugs will not work and at that moment that we will go for the liver transplantation i told you about non-alcoholic state of hepatitis nowadays that uh, 
uh, it's a leading cause for the liver disease and it's because of the fat infiltration in the liver called the NAFLD, but when that it causes inflammation, so fat along with inflammation is called as the NASH, non-alcoholic is due to hepatitis. And in NASH, you will get raised SGPT. In NFLD, there will be only fat, there will be no inflammation, you will not get raised SGPT. So nowadays, it is very big problem that increasing liver transplantation numbers because of this NAFLD and a very treatable disease, you will get hepatomegaly, high triglyceride, you may have your patient might have acanthosis nigricans, insulin resistance. So treatment is the weight loss and diet and exercise. Certain drugs have been said that have a role made for in vitamin E or so these all are antioxidant helping the liver but the main results have been seen with significant weight loss, diet and uh, low fat diet and exercise can help a lot in decreasing fatty liver. <clears throat> then extra hepatic biliary atresia we have already discussed only to share with you this uh, picture of the clicular stool and that is the paraparatic cholangiogram that dye is being passed in the GV and it is going towards the hepatic side but it's not going towards the duodenum sides only intrahepatic ducts you can see. Um, here, these are the intrahepatic ducts. If you are, uh, my cursor is visible to you, and this is a GB where dye is being passed. So, treatment is uh, before eight weeks. Best is that go for the uh, hepatoportoenterostomy. And for screening for the biliary atresia, that one should keep this card, should give to the mothers that uh, when newborn should be discharged, they should be given this card that please look the stool and when you get uh, first list of the abnormal stool, you, you have, have to contact me. back. So alpha-1 antitrypsin, although it's a rare and it's present with the chronic liver disease, regarding the treatment that in the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, that treatment is supportive or in end stage cases that liver transplantation is there. Little about PFIC that they present with the clay color intermittent stool. While in stool, they were itching. Uh, there's a low gamma GTN1 and 2 and high gamma GTN type 3. And again, that uh, depend upon the severity that if severe enough, they get early cirrhosis. And uh, sometime even they go with intermittent itching and jaundice till adolescent life having no significant fibrosis in the liver. So it's the spectrum of the progress of familial intrahepatic polystasis. You might get patient of either mild severity or you might get the severe patient depending upon that. So treatment is in case of PFIC, you have to give enzyme inducers, phenobarbitone, rifampicin, arsodeoxycholic acid. It's a water soluble bile salt is further help in the bile excretion bile salt binding rhizons, cholestyramine, they also help in the decreasing the bile salt level, or you may go for the surgical process of the bilary diversion in which bile duct is diverted toward the colon, and you know that bile salts are reabsorbed from the ileum. So from uh, gallbladder, that duct is connected with the colon as passing the ileum that these biliary uh, bile salt recirculation will not happen and bile salt will be lost in the stool and low bile salt will improve the itching. And ultimately in end stage, there will be the option of the liver transplantation. Very important is the chronic hepatitis B having the five stages and uh, labeled as the chronic hepatitis B E antigen positive chronic infection when SGPT is normal, when SGPT is raised, we will say the chronic hepatitis. Third entity is hepatitis B E antigen negative chronic infection when SGPT is normal, when it gets raised, then it will be the chronic hepatitis. And surface antigen variant you will also get when there is the core antibody positive, we call it as occult hepatitis B infection. So you will get a different sort of uh, viral markers that uh, in case and uh, this picture will tell you about uh, hepatitis B E antigen positive phase one having high surface antigen E antigen positive high DNA load but ALT normal so we will say is a hepatitis B E antigen positive infection uh, is an infection not the hepatitis but same uh, that if that get a 
SGPT get elevated, other things remain will be the same. We will call as a chronic hepatitis B hepatitis and below the older name are also given. Third entity, when E antigen become negative, then if SGPT is normal, phase is the E antigen negative hepatitis B infection. But uh, this virus can develop the mutations. Despite of E antigen negative, the virus can replicate, then you will the higher DNA load, elevated SGPT, that will be chronic hepatitis B, E antigen negative hepatitis. And last one, when surface antigen is in the negative, but uh, DNA circularly covalently coiled DNA present in the hepatocyte that cannot be taken out from the hepatocyte that is labeled as the occult infection that although functionally cure surface antigen negative but still hepatitis B is inside the hepatocyte is called as the occult infection. Regarding the treatment, sometimes many PGs are worried about the treatment of hepatitis B. So uh, when SGPT is normal, you will be not treated. So only SGPT is not the marker, but we have to assess if any degree of cirrhosis in the patient. Uh, advanced liver disease must be treated. If liver is normal, synthetic function are normal, SGPT is normal, then we have to follow the child three monthly with the SGPT in cases of hepatitis B. These are the different drug options available. Now the anti caver can be given more than two years of the age is the safe and good drugs, but where, wherever indicated. So proper indication is important in cases of hepatitis B. So this is a timeline for their treatment how, when they were introduced. Regarding hepatitis C, currently very good drugs, very uh, curative drugs for the hepatitis C are available and Luckily, these are recommended for child greater than three years of the age. So, phosphor based, so phosphor based therapies, these are called. And you can see here that only 12 week treatment for the greater than three years of the age, that combination of lady face wear and so phosphor only for the three months that they are curative, more than 95% clearance of the virus has been seen. And another is the so phosphor and well pets were for all genotypes for more than 17 kg that is indicated. So these newer drugs you should keep in mind during uh, lung case viva about the hepatitis C. Now autoimmune hepatitis that uh, we have discussed that they present with the recurrent fevers, joint pain, jaundice, men come into the itching. There is the criteria for that. You might uh, keep this criteria with you when you repeatedly apply on the patient, then you will remember this criteria and uh, the interface hepatitis on the biopsy, we know that as the diagnostic and we have to rule out other diseases as well. And treatment includes the immunosuppressive and uh, steroids, azathioprine for the maintenance therapy and other drugs. So uh, if we are not treating these all diseases timely, then definitely we have to treat the complications like portal hypertension, ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, hepatorenal syndrome and hepatopulmonary syndrome. So. Uh, when you uh, tell about the management of the chronic liver disease, you must tell about the nutritional management, that I will make the plan for nutritional management of the, this chronic liver disease patient, that I will give high protein. If a patient is in the encephalopathy, then we restrict the protein. Otherwise, these patients need higher quantity of protein, higher quantity of carbohydrate. They need medium chain triglyceride, long chain triglyceride, we have to limit the salt, we have to give higher calories, 150% from the required and definitely the all fat soluble uh, vitamins should be given. In cases of hepatic encephalopathy, there is a protocol definitely uh, we can ask from you in a long case that if child is going in the hepatic encephalopathy, what you will do, you have to maintain sugar, you have to maintain electrolytes, you have to maintain triggering factors, you have to give leg to dose and sterilize the gut with the foxam and antibiotics and in cases of stage 2 or stage 3 encephalopathy, uh, benzodiazepine antagonist, filmazenil to have a role and the benzodiazepine should not be given for sedation for these patients. In cases of the esophageal rises, patient present the hematomasis, you have to do endoscopy, you have to document the varices and treatment for the varices. Either you have to stabilize the patient with the blood transfusion and you have to give IV octirotide or trilipresin, you have to give IV omeprazole. When patient get stabilized, can undergo general anesthesia, then bending or sclerotherapy can be done. 
by endoscopy. And after the session, we keep the patient on the propranolol and follow up on the propranolol. During active bleed, propranolol should be stopped because uh, it will mask the uh, tachycardia because it so slow the heart rate. And at that time, you have to go IV octirotite or telepresin or omeprazole. Once stabilized and you have done the session of the bending or sclerotropy on outpatient, you can, you can keep the patient on the propranolol. For the ascites, we have to restrict the fluid and salt, and we have to give aldectone. We know the secondary hyperaldosteronism, that aldosterone is higher. If liver uh, is not functioning, then there is a higher sodium in the body. We have to give low sodium and diuretics, and sometimes we need to, to ascitic tip. So prognosis of liver disease depend upon the etiology, severity of insult, treatment of primary cause. If you are early treating, progression to cirrhosis. If portal hypertension, ascites, hepatic infectopathy, and also if someone has access to the liver transplantation, that changes the prognosis that, that treat the end-stage liver disease. So indication of liver transplants are the same, which we previously discussed, and uh, uh, that is the very important that when you asked for the management, you must mention that child of score that I will apply the score to the patient and I will see that in which class it is coming. If it is class A, is a compensated chronic liver disease, means we have a time we can manage in this stage uh, patient on the drugs with the support to treatment, with the nutrition, with the fat soluble vitamins and the class B. And when it comes in the class C, then the severe liver disease, we have prepared for the liver transplantation and we have to counsel the family and uh, another new score is the paled score, pediatric end stage liver disease uh, score. And in this, that age, weight, height, albumin, bilirubin, INR, these all are taken in account. And this score tells us about that how much a patient can wait for liver transplantation to give the priority because it's not easily and freely available. In the West, there is the list waiting for the liver transplant and they prioritize on the basis of these scores in the adult. It is a male discord in the pediatric population is the pale discord. And uh, certain diseases are the exception, like the down, if you are looking at there, that the urea cycle defect, those patients cannot wait or ignic acidemias or hepatoblastoma, malignancies, those can't wait. They doesn't come in the pale discord. They were they are exceptions that they should be diagnosed and should go for the liver transplant because otherwise they will not survive. Little last couple of two slides, couple slides about the liver transplantation. Most PGs always get worried that what is the orthotopic liver transplantation and what is the auxiliary partial orthotopic liver transplantation. In case of auxiliary liver transplantation, that technique is that some portion of the donor liver is engrafted in the recipient and native liver remain there. And this auxiliary liver transplant done in acute fulminant failures, where we hope that his own liver might start to work till that we have to give uh, another liver to support him or in certain genetic diseases like uh, uh, let's suppose for the Kirkland Najar and uh, we are hoping that gene therapy may be successful till that to get the time we have to give auxiliary liver transplant. So these are the, some indications in cases of auxiliary liver transplant. Otherwise, the orthotopic liver transplantation is the most commonly used in which that the own native liver of the patient is removed and donor liver is kept in the same anatomical position. That's why it is called as the orthotopic. Orthotopic means it is kept in the same anatomical position and uh, that natal liver is removed, that is the orthotopic liver transplantation. And uh, only uh, names of the new modalities, like you know the dialysis and the renal diseases, there is the extra carponeal liver support devices, albumin-based dialysis, also this device is for the liver, that it removes the ammonia and other uh, things and aid the albumin that what is required. And hepatocyte transplantation is also going on apart from uh, trials of hepatocyte transplantation with good encouraging results has been seen till under trials and liver directed gene therapy in particular genetic diseases which we have discussed like in a tyrosinemia or in such as these trials are going on to support our patients. 
so these are the my references uh, for my presentation and uh, now uh, any sort of the question that is welcome and i am here to give you answer thank you dr reed extremely knowledgeable very nice presentation and uh, participants if any one of you want to unmute your mic and ask uh, any question they can go ahead i have a couple of questions in the chat box but i'll first let anyone from the participants speak if they want to unmute the mic and ask any question. Uh, Dr. Aris, yes. uh, really yes. very nice. And, uh, I have one question. Uh, you say that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Sir, we will keep short cases in our differential, so what will we do on this point? Ke basis pe uh, I mentioned that you can definitely keep obese in the obese. Uh, in an obese patient, you can keep the diagnosis of this fatty liver disease if there is a epitomegaly. Or sometimes they also have other features like acanthosis nigricans. These are the markers for indicating the metabolic uh, disorder uh, that indicating towards the diabetes and hepatitis. So, uh, means you have to keep in the mind this uh, from exam point of view and also in your daily practice for the patient that it's very important nowadays to recognize it because treatment depends upon the diet and physical exercise. So uh, that you can keep in the obese patient that might be discussed with you. Although rarely discussed, but I mentioned that it is, uh, I thought it is an important one that that's why I kept this to tell you about that. Uh, sir, I had a question for you, that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, what age group will we keep in it? What age group can 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 we keep in it? Like ascites can we keep in it? What age group can we keep in it? What age group can we keep in it? What age group can we keep in it? So, you have to understand that uh, I mentioned that uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease when there is only fat in the liver and it has not started the inflammation, right? So we label as a NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But when uh, there is a, a damage inflammation to the hepatocytes that correlate with the raised SGPT, uh, biochemically you will get the higher SGPT. Even on the biopsy you will get inflammation along with the fat. That is labeled as a niche, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Once that process of steatohepatitis has started, that can lead to the liver cirrhosis. And once any disease that can cause liver cirrhosis, you can get all sort of stigmata at that moment. What happens that usually that fatty liver disease is most common in the adolescent age group and uh, till 20 to 30 years, they remain stable. And by 30 to 40 years that if uh, they have not controlled their fat in the liver that is causing inflammation, they develop cirrhosis. So that's why in the pediatric, we are not uh, looking the consequences of the fatty liver disease that, but we must know that start is in, from the pediatric age group. We have to control it here to prevent such uh, unfortunate complication of the cirrhosis. So once cirrhosis develops, you can get all sort of the stigmata. And it's most common in the adolescent age group. Sir, some of the questions I would like to put forward from the chat box. So yes. uh, one of the participants have asked, how much stigmata should be present to label a child with CLD? For instance, if you are examining and there's only liver and spleen, so Apart from that, how many more so, segments? So, uh, like in other diseases that uh, they score the things and uh, mention that if such a score is there, we will label. In cases of chronic liver disease, if there is an isolated hepatomegaly, only alone hepatomegaly is a chronic liver disease. So here we don't need to make a number of these. So on the complete examination, if you are getting that uh, means you should make the conclusion 
not that if clubbing is there, only one stigmata is there and I'm making the diagnosis of chronic liver disease. That may be the familial, absolutely normal uh, people having the clubbing because of familial causes. And that might be secondary to the, any pulmonary problem or recurrent chest infections. So we cannot label on the basis of one thing. We have to see the generalized and uh, isolated hepatomegaly on a single sign, you can make the diagnosis of the chronic liver disease. So there is no scoring or no uh, in a minimum number of the stigmata if this is there or that is not there. If someone has a cirrhotic portal hypertension, then definitely back pressure will lead to the splenomegaly. Either in earlier stage, it's not there. That will be the occult. We also discuss about the occult in definition. I told you that biochemical derangement persistent for three months. So on clinical setting, definitely that biochemical uh, derangement you cannot get if you have gone through for any sort of screening and in that screening uh, you have found the hepatitis b positive and followed by you saw the sgpt that was elevated so in such situation you can also make the diagnosis of chronic liver diseases on the clinical basis there is the no number that are cut off that we have to make the diagnosis on this basis thank you sir thank you some more questions and i would be putting forward t long case related questions first because some of the questions are theory related, related. so that is beyond the scope of our session so the next uh, question is so how to check the depth of jaundice the in, on clinical examination so uh, usually in the newborn that uh, when it's more than five milligram per deciliter then it comes in the sclera and in the older children, more than three milligram, it become appreciable in the sclera. And we all know that elastic tissue of the sclera has the more affinity. Once when bilirubin going to get rise, that first area that is the sclera, which we appreciate the presence of jaundice. And uh, from neonatology, we all very well know that if uh, uh, jaundice is uh, only confined to the face that we think that it is around the five to six milligram and then up to elbow and up to palm. Talking about the older children and up to palm and sole, it is level as the 20 milligram and the more. But in the older children, if you concentrate on the child of score, you will find that one milligram, less than one milligram is the score is given one. When it becomes one to two milligram, that is also not appreciable. In laboratory one, that is given a score two, and anything above three milligram, that mild become only visible in the eyes. That is given score three. So older children presence of jaundice is sufficient, uh, indicating the significant liver disease. And if you want to even make the severity of the bilirubin, then in a newborn period or infancy, you can make for that. And that is important basically for the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. For the conjugated bilirubinemia, even if the 40 milligram, we not particularly treat the bilirubin, we treat the underlying cause and as a general, the liver disease, not the bilirubin. Thank you, sir. Any more uh, participants who want to- Assalamu alaikum. It's Dr. Abu Bakr Sadiq from Sawat. Uh, sir, I have a question there. Uh, is, uh, do we have any facility of liver dialysis in Pakistan? Uh, in adult setup, we do have, even in uh, Karachi, that uh, Dao, Oja, that Niljit Central, they have a system and uh, not in the particularly pediatric and definitely uh, even in the acute liver failure of cases, we only give supportive care, ICU care, Apart from that, not for such sort of system in the pediatric age group here in the Karachi, I have not got maybe in Islamabad, but for the adults, these are there. I know about that. Uh, sir, uh, how much time uh, it's needed to be repeated liver dialysis in adults just for knowledge purposes? So, uh, uh, means these all are the bridging therapies. Right? Yes, sir. Bridging yes, therapies sir. means uh, if you have a facility of liver transplantation, until that you want to stabilize the patient, you want to decrease the ammonia, you want to prevent the brain damage by these 
toxic substances. So these are the for short periods, periods to make uh, availability of the liver transplantation because you know the liver transplantation is not easy. We have to search for the donor and that donor should not be non-diseased, his cholesterol, his GPT should be normal. Then uh, we have to take liver from that person. So in some acute conditions, till to make the arrangements for liver transplant, they keep the patient on them. These are not like the renal dialysis that they continuously come and they are living with the dialysis. So such sort of dialysis are not there for the liver diseases. Thank you, sir. Samakin, sir. Uh, sir, what is the most cause for liver transplant in Pakistan and worldwide? So uh, in pediatric age group, uh, majority are the biliary atresia and uh, some cases of the progressive uh, familial intrahepatic cholestasis in our country that uh, screening systems are not good some of our patients of the wilson's disease which are uh, treatable with the drugs but when they come in the end stage so they go for the liver transplant so most common is the blurry atresia and pfic and uh, uh, even although we have an inborn error of metabolism a lot of urea cycle defect and such means uh, or hyperlipidemia where liver transplant is indicated but uh, unfortunately that uh, they, they are not getting because these are not freely and uh, smoothly available means once to think about the liver transplant you have to try hard to make the transplantation done because of the cost issue because of the expertise for the pediatric because some centers are not doing liver transplant below the weight of 15 kg and most of the time you know the pillary atresia patient are of the 2 to 3 kg uh, 5 to 6 kg and maximally they go up to 8 to 9 kg and they have a R rate of the ascitic fluid so uh, some uh, so expertise are still lacking in the pediatric age group but some private setups and some even when government setup is are taking the patients for liver transplantation, still we have not the results that what are the outcome of these centers because it's also beginning that uh, sufficient number of patients has been went uh, underwent for the liver transplant. So one question, yeah, quick. one more question. Now one more question about the, the flow is uh, dilated mean flow. Jota. Flow away from the umbilicus, it shows the obstruction of the IVC and cirrhosis. So, normally is the flow towards the umbilicus? Or is it showing towards the umbilicus? I tried my best to make uh, clear you about the, uh, these uh, flow and visible means because it's most commonly asked question from the trainees. So, I mentioned there, there are two types of the means. Capit modisa is a separate one, and that is around the umbilicus. And umbilicus is a watershed area. It gets flow away from umbilicus, means upward winds will get upward, downwards winds will get downwards. And it is a portosystemic shunting area. And now we are talking about the peripheral winds. Normally, these winds remain collapsed and superficially, in these are the superficial winds present the periphery of the abdomen. So normally, then don't have a sufficient flow. But what happens when there is an inferior vena cava obstruction or uh, liver cirrhosis that compromise the inferior vena cava or portal vein obstruction, then we know the reversal of the portal flow. So that reversal of portal flow, definitely these are venous fluid and venous blood has to come towards the heart. So, the, so these superficial veins get open and flow comes upward. And upward, it drains in the territories of superior vena cava and comes towards the heart. And so, when there is the superior vena cava obstruction, although it's an emergency, you will not get the such patient in uh, exam setup that when there is a superior vena cava obstruction, so they have a face congestion, plethora, they have a breathing difficulty, and they also have these visible superficial pains. But at that time, their flow is downwards because they come down and they empty their blood into the territories of the inferior vena cava to reach up to the heart. So that is the flow in cases of superior vena cava and inferior vena cava obstruction, talking about superficial veins. Capit medusa is the portosystemic shunting area around the umbilicus, and that takes 
blood away from umbilicus. Uh, sir, for asymptomatic cases of Wilson disease, zinc acetate is recommended. But uh, zinc acetate is not available in peripheries like in Sawat or in, even in Peshawar. Can we use zinc sulfate? So, uh, when we talk about these salt, that zinc sulfate, zinc acetate, we always talk about that availability of the elemental zinc, that how much that uh, zinc will provide elemental zinc. In cases of zinc acetate, we give 50 milligram three times a day, means 150 milligram. So uh, when zinc sulfate was used, it has been seen that 200 milligram sachet uh, three times a day will be used. So then it becomes higher quantity, not that you are only this uh, zinc sulfate syrup, which contains only 20 milligram of the zinc sulfate. And uh, another point is that a lot of trials are with the zinc acetate uh, uh, that have found to be efficacious for decreasing the copper content. So that's why we really recommended that zinc acetate should be given. And uh, third one that in asymptomatic patients, if you are putting them on the zinc acetate, you have to be careful. You have a strict follow-up. Sometimes these are not so efficacious uh, than penicillamine that your patient might go in a cirrhosis and you will, uh, means if you are keeping on the diet and zinc acetate, you have a strictly monitor of the SGPT and liver examination that if it starts to deteriorate, then you will not get the time proper to give the other medications. So better in a diagnosed Wilson's disease, we have to give the penicillamine, which has found to be effective. Although again, along with the penicillamine, we have to monitor for the complications and uh, all these. Thank you, sir. Assalamualaikum, sir. I have a question. Um, sir, in progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis, what is uh, the proper way of diagnosing it? Like, I understand that gamma glutamyl transpeptidase is... Uh, raised uh, in type 3 and in type 1 and type 2, it is low. But uh, what is the diagnostic test? Is it a genetic so, test or biopsy or what? Yeah. So starting from the history that uh, particularly in the cases of PFIC, you have uh, itching. You will in other disease, itching is less likely. Whenever you get itching, itching and I show you the picture of the thick skin, like unification of the skin, that leather type skin they might have. So they constantly rub, scratch their skin and that become hard enough, leather-like. So that from the history and examination, you will get idea. Then gamma GT, you have mentioned yourself. Then when we are going for the liver biopsy in such cases, we have a ductular proliferation or even sometimes gen cell transformation. So these all are, even liver biopsy will be uh, means... Uh, uh, supportive in a diagnosis but definite diagnosis is on the genetic basis here we are knowing about only three type of pfic but now if you uh, look through the genetic types then now type 4 and other type of the progressive familial intra hepatic cholestasis has been reported usp 53 mutation so main is the genetic basis and a lot of different mutation has been found means pfic also has a lot of spectrum different different genes are involving they all are presenting with the same features so genetic diagnosis should be there biopsy you, is important you. biopsy is also important in the categorization of the liver fibrosis so when you are looking at there is a no fibrosis or mild degree of fibrosis then uh, you can go for the uh, options which i mentioned biliary divergence in which what you do that uh, uh, small bowel conduit from uh, uh, gallbladder, you insert it towards the colon and you know that bile salt are reabsorbed from the ileum. You halt that recirculation of the bile salt and bile salt get lost from the body in a stool and there were decreased number of the bile salt and decreased damage to the liver. So biopsy is important from that point of view see the degree of fibrosis.
So I think that brings an end to our session. Thank you so much, Dr. Arid. Uh, any last points, any last uh, closing points that you would like to share with so, us? Uh, last point is same, uh, being a hepatologist, I must emphasize that uh, yes, although this whole activity is for the long case, long case means our patient, or the suffering from chronic liver disease. So, which I kept uh, in my presentation, oh. that please, please make the diagnosis earlier and those diseases which are curable with uh, diet only, some diseases are curable with diet and drugs and uh, some with only drugs. So, identify early, institute Mama. early management, Mama. Prevent the end Mama. stage total hypertension, ascites. So, so uh, in such situation, when uh, you uh, in earlier stages you are unable to treat them, then there will be advanced fibrosis and end stage liver disease. Then you have to treat with the varices. You have to go for a repeated session of bending. You have to treat the ascites, repeated day, build up on fat soluble vitamin. So life become more difficult. And finally, then liver transplant, which is very difficult in our country and very costly management. And uh, that require strict monitoring, even after liver transplant, that patients are on the immunosuppressive drugs and their levels and their... Uh, infections by the rare organisms like CMV and herpes, uh, that EBV viruses that causes infection. So these all should be kept in the mind that earlier to treat, better outcome you will get. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. And everyone is appreciating a lot. Thank you. A lot, of, a lot of positive comments are coming in and we have definitely recorded this session. It will be available on our our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Uh, stay tuned to PNMDB for more of such sessions. And we would ask uh, Sir again, uh, inshallah, uh, to um, to uh, spare some time again for another uh, really nice session. Thank you, Sir, once again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sir, I have also... one small question, if I may ask. Okay, sure. Yeah. You can go ahead and then we. We'll... Sir, just wanted to ask the role of n style cysteine for acute hepatic failure, which is not due to paracetamol poisoning. And is it part of guidelines uh, now that we can give n style cysteine in acute hepatic failure? So, uh, discussing about the management of fulminant failure, that uh, standard protocol is different in different areas because of non-availability of the certain facilities like Earlier, we discussed about the bridging dialyzer units till liver transplant or auxiliary liver transplant that we have to put a donor liver till on native liver start to function. Such things are being done in the worldwide. So here, we don't have such facilities. So we manage, our standard care management is to maintain the sugar, to give the omeprazole and uh, we have to give antibiotics, we have to manage electrolytes. Along with that, uh, some role in previous trials has been reported that N-acetylcysteine being as an antioxidant helps a lot in the liver in a recovery from fulminant injury. So we are also using it here, although recommendations are not there because we don't have a sufficient number of options, uh, sufficient number of options to manage our patient from such lethal condition. So here, anything available supportive thing, because in some studies, statistically significant uh, benefit has been reported. In other studies, there is no benefit. Toxicity has not been reported anywhere because of uh, no any sort of side effect from this drug and uh, it might, uh, sometimes it is used in cases of the fulminant failure when we have no other option. And you know that, that there is uh, no known point that 
which patient is get going to recover even in the from the grade 4 encephalopathy many patient on the very other day become awake and out of the coma so either liver is getting by itself from that insult or our anesthetic system is working anywhere statistically there is no answer but we sometimes use it in our patients thank you very much sir okay so uh, sir, sir can i ask a question thank you sir can i ask a question please yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yes yeah, sir uh, sometimes in long case we used to have a very short uh, history of jaundice or edema or ascites uh, like uh, these things uh, manifestations of cld but okay. sir uh, on examination we used to have splenomegaly or um, uh, uh, that uh, liver is enlarged so how to justify uh, that this is a case of cld uh, even having a history of short uh, short time so uh, in initial uh, slides i mentioned that uh, other diseases which also involve the liver and uh, some uh, systemic illnesses or neoplastic lesions storage disorders hemolytic anemia they all have a hepatomegaly and splenomegaly so uh, when you are looking at the patient that that is not the matter of the history even if, if history is the short one on the examination you have to decide if there is only hepatosplenomegaly and uh, we know about the storage disorder patient that they have some neurological involvement and uh, they have a very firm liver and spleen and there is very large size of the spleen in the lipid storage disorders and if you are talking about apart from storage disorders like sometime lymphoma non hodgkin lymphoma that can present with the jaundice and hepatosplenomegaly and lymph nodes are at the porta hepatis they are causing obstructive jaundice so there is the short history so so depend upon the history and the clinical examination you might get the some lymph nodes enlarged in that situation so that depends upon that what find physical findings you are getting in the patient according to that you have to make your differential sometime you make a full diagnosis of that it's the case of chronic liver disease and you entertain the differential of the chronic liver disease only and sometime you are unable to label chronic liver disease you keep chronic liver disease as a differential along with uh, uh, non hodgkin lymphoma malignancies and hemolytic anemia so that depend upon patient to patient that what physical signs you are getting and what you make to able the diagnosis on the basis of those physical findings Thank you, sir, so much. I know there are a lot of questions, but we'll be back again soon. Okay. So, so last yes. last comment that I'm very thankful to your organization for providing me this opportunity. Although it was first time, Dr. Sabita uh, told me and she said me about uh, told me about you. So it's very nice activity. Uh, what I found that active participation of all the PGs and although uh, long cases. i already said are difficult on the zoom meeting these should be on the bed side on the patients but uh, seems that this way is also very helpful in the exam thank you sir thank you. thank you so much and thank you everyone take care see you soon thank you allah hafiz allah hafiz